All right, so today we have a very special candidate up on the repair bench, or repair TV tray. Uh, this is a Philco Model 71 Cathedral set. It was uh, dropped off by a kind gentleman that wanted the uh, set to function. The cabinet had uh, had some work done to it. It's not bad. I don't quite think it's the original finish colors. Looks like they uh, probably just gave it a light coat of golden oak stain, maybe something a little darker on the inside section here, and this grill cloth is uh, definitely not original. He was, he definitely pointed that out, and they polished the escutcheon as, as high as they could, which generally isn't how they would have been. But uh, point is, he, uh, he, he, this, he, says, he says the radio was being thrown in the garbage by his neighbors, and he caught them before they could properly get rid of it, which, good on him for that. I've heard of a lot of people doing it before, and it still amazes me that you could try throwing away something in as good a shape as this it is. There's a, there's a few blemishes on the surface, a little bit of missing veneer here or there, but on the whole, it has all the knobs, uh, all the tubes appear to be present and accounted for, and overall, it's not in bad shape. Uh, this particular set does, in fact, have a tuning meter up here. I've got a shadow meter. Philco would like to use those. I think my 37640 has one. And then the uh, dial there. The dial scale is a little bit, a little bit messed up. In fact, it looks to be a little bit warped right there. So we're gonna have to do something about that. Either get a reproduction of that, or see if we can flatten it out. Didn't notice that in my initial inspection. Um, but as you said, he tried plugging again, firing it up. There is evidence on the back. That the electrolytic capacitors are definitely toast and he says there's a sticker on the inside that says that work was done to the set as to what work was done I don't really know but we're gonna find out so I am going to flip this thing around and we're gonna take a look at the chassis and then I'll go ahead and get that pulled out in a second alright so here we got the chassis and it's hard to see but the original paper label is still inside showing the positioning of the tubes for the model 71 um, all the tubes appear to be there. This should be the 42 output tube. Let's take a look there. Yeah, it's a Kenrad replacement. So I'm going to start pulling these individually and setting them aside for uh, safekeeping here. This little fella should be a 37. Ah, so we got a 76. The Chassis yeah, does not specify the use of a 76. I'll have to check and see if those are uh, compatible types. They might be. And then we should have our rectifier over here. There, there's what looks to be a bayonet-based lamp holder right here. I'm not sure what that's for. And there's a switch on the side here that I would guess would be for local distant, except that uh, I don't think the Model 71 ever had a local distant switch. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's something on the front for that. So we might we might look at cleaning whatever this nonsense is, uh, probably a, uh, a replacement or a modification by one of the former owners. All uh, right, get the 80 out of here. Thankfully, the 80 is probably one of the most common rectifier tubes you'll find. Yeah, this is a, uh, a later replacement. However, we do have some bits of junk in the top of the envelope there and the top of the plates appear to be fried so I'll have to get a replacement rectifier I might have a spare 80 somewhere but I know I can get more so the rectifier tube is dead uh, that could be a cause for concern I'm definitely going to need to ohm out the, the uh, power transformer and make sure there isn't anything damaged there because if that is shot then we are really in trouble uh, okay, there's also some fraying at the socket for the speaker. That's not good because this is an electrodynamic type, and we get a short between the B plus there. We could also damage the uh, the rectifier tube, so uh, may not be looking so good right off the bat. But I don't want to I don't want to get my hopes down all the way just yet. I'm gonna go ahead and get this tube shield off here. This is supposed to be a 40. Four. Tube shield's a little screwed up. We'll have to get the uh, dents out of that. And we've got all kinds of wonderful 
wonderful junk on here. Lint and dust bunnies and all the fun stuff. Okay. Let's see if the grid cap will want to move. Alright. Try and be gentle with it. There we go. And let's see, this is a number 44, it looks like 3944, so a universal replacement. And then we've got the three others that I'm not going to touch. Another pair of 44s and maybe a 36 it says? It's hard to see. Uh, I do want to get this, since we need to pull a chassis out, we're going to need to disconnect the speaker plug. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now, there is a repair label on the inside, and I looked at it, and I can't quite tell when exactly it was written. The date is kind of badly written on there. Uh, but if I had to guess, well, actually, I, I can't guess, because the, this radio repair shops have been around. It was actually done as a radio repair shop, and it does specify that they replaced an electrolytic capacitor, the tone control, is listed as having been replaced and something else on top of that. So it's had some servicing done to it, but nothing comprehensive. And this Philco, like all Philco's from him, from this era, have uh, those wonderful bake-like condenser blocks inside them that'll need to be uh, rebuilt. Never done that before. I've heard it's actually pretty easy. Okay, so go ahead and wiggle the speaker plug out of there. Since we can't fire this set up, and I really don't want to chance it, looks like it's going to need some serious help here. Yeah, a few things we need to do. Now, this plug and these wires here is going to have to, I'm going to have to take this plug apart. It's, uh, it's riveted together, and I don't have any riveting tools, so it might just be that I have to drill those out, resolder the wires nice and cleanly, and then possibly just screw it back together. The only problem with that is that I'm never going to get screws with heads that are small enough to sit up in there, so I might also have to consider pop rivets. That's, uh, <laughs> that's going to be a little tricky, so one of those little goofy little things you have to deal with. And then we'll go ahead and we'll loosen the nut on this switch over here. I'm pretty sure this is not supposed to be there. I mean, why, why else would you have a bayonet style thing hanging off right there? There are already two lamps in this thing, one for the dial and the other for the shadow tuner. It's just a bit silly, really. Getting this thing out may not be white, so there we go. Yeah, so it was a bit of an oddity. Alright, so we got that out. Um, oh, one thing I want to double check though is the condition of the voice coil. So, let me grab a 9 volt battery real quick. Some variety. Well, my 9 volt was already right next to me. How about that? So, if one thing that's always a good idea is to make sure, especially on an electrodynamic speaker, that everything is still functioning. Uh, I don't know how they set the pins up on here. I might have to check my schematic, but. Oh, we're getting a click there. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely have to check and see, but we are getting a click anyway out of what sounds like the voice coil. Hopefully that's the voice coil. Uh, yeah, so the next step is just going to be to pull this sucker out, take a look underside. We're going to need to do a test on the transformer, 
and go from there. Well, it took a little more effort than I thought it would, but we finally got the chassis out of the blasted thing. So, as I was, as I was suspicious of, there is a warped section on the dial here. Um, I'll see what I can do to flatten that out, maybe just by setting it under a lamp or using a little bit of heat from my uh, heat gun just to try and get it back into shape. But if need be, I do believe Radio Days makes reproduction graphics for this set, so it wouldn't be impossible to get a new one. Uh, one thing that really annoyed me was whoever installed this switch here did not for, for one minute consider the fact that putting it on the side of the chassis like they did makes it a complete and utter pain to get the chassis back out of the cabinet. Because this this the, the the chassis in this thing the sides has slightly shrunk inward so it pinches on either side so when I'm trying to pull it out of there this thing is dragging and on top of that it the thickness of the cabinet sides is thicker at the back there's a pair of reinforcing wood pieces and this will snag on them so I had to lift it up and, and do some acrobatics with it in order to actually get it out of there and that's just I hate doing that it's really dumb uh, so, what have we got? Well, we can see my lighting isn't all that great. I'm having trouble just getting it to work with me rather than against me here. But, uh, let's see if we can focus in on that. Alright, so at the corner, ah, yeah, it seems a bit awkward. At that corner right here, we have our two main filter capacitors, eight microfarad deals, and this one, you can see this wonderful uh, junk sitting on top of it that looks like bird crap. That is the electrolyte. These things are filled with a fluid, and that fluid does go bad. It dries up, and in this case, if it gets to a point where you're using the set and the capacitor it has a lot of leakage, it'll actually boil. There are these little holes drilled in the top there to release pressure. On the early ones, there were no release holes, and the top of the cap would actually start to bulge as basically steam built up in it because you're boiling the electrolyte. Now, what else do we have going on here? Well, the tuner is a fabric-driven deal, and that seems to work A-OK. -okay. Nothing, nothing really wrong there except for the dial scrapes basically on everything, so it, it might just be a better idea to go ahead and replace that. But let's flip it over and really see where where the good stuff is and if there are any blaring problems that we need to uh, address. Like I mentioned, we're going to have to double check the transformer. Damn it. Handling these things like this is never easy. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, so I'll readjust the camera and bring the light into the picture here. And we can see that um, absolutely nothing has actually been done to this set. Electrically, anyway. Uh, oh, well, hold up. That is a replacement. And judging by the connections here, uh, they just broke one of the terminals off and called it a day. This, this is the epitome of completely complete shit repairs. I, I don't know who actually paid someone to do this, but they should be ashamed. The other thing that I can see is that uh, they've installed a switch here, volume control, and it has a power switch segment, or at least it should. It's got terminals on the back for that sort of thing. Let's see, do we actually seem to use... No. In fact, there's a screw driven in there, so these are some really half-assed repairs. Power transform, uh, power resistor right there. So all of these guys right here, these Bakelite blocks, these have capacitors in them, and we're going to have to open those up, scoop the guts out, put new stuff in there, and then just solder them to the inside. Uh, apparently it's not that big of a deal. And then, of course, we have this wonderful arrangement here with the braided wiring going I, I, I really don't know what the hell is up with that 
but my uh, guide, my radio guide, does have a diagram for this, and it has part number references and all that good stuff, so I'll be able to give that a look over. But I think the first thing I'm going to do is... Question why I took this on? No. Um, <laughs> ah, okay. This... This is the power switch. So the, apparently they must not have had a volume control. So what they did was they just took a volume power control and just eliminated the power feature. Prevented it from going into the switch section. That's kind of lazy, actually. But if that's all you got, I guess that's all you got. And then this over here is just a simple switch with some uh, fraying wiring going to it. It's this is going to take some work, uh, I'll be honest. This, this is going to take some work to correct. Because from what I can see, there was absolutely nothing done properly in this set. Power cord's going to have to go. It's getting extremely stiff. I'll probably swing by Sundial Wire or, or somebody and uh, get a good, uh, a good cloth cord. Same one that I used for my 1920s RCA AC-powered sets. But, uh, yeah. I'm going to start by digging into the power transformer here. I'll grab my multimeter and see how the windings check out. Alright, so I'm back with my multimeter. Right now I've got my leads hooked up across the, uh, the, the plug. And we're going to test to make sure that the primary of this thing is still good. Alright, so... It looks like the switch contacts might be a bit on the dirty side, or the plug's dirty. But yes, the primary does have continuity, so that's a good sign. Now I need to check the other really important stuff, the uh, high voltage taps and the filament connection. So I've got the, uh, the 80 rectifier pulled, so we're going to try and get in to the socket here. We need to find the two large pins, because those are the uh, filament connections. Right, and then we want the high voltage connections which are going to be here and here all right and then we should have a center tap all right let's check the other side all right so that doesn't seem bad uh, it does make me wonder why the rectifier took a dump it's possible that the uh, electrolytics failed, uh, caused an excessive amount of current draw through the 80, blew the 80, and then it stopped there, and we got lucky and it didn't destroy the power transformer. But uh, why am I turning this off when we still need this? The uh, next thing that I want to do here is check to see whether or not we actually get voltages. Now, with the, with the uh, 80 out, there's no way that this thing can produce high voltage for the tubes and all that, so we're not in danger of blowing anything else up. But I would definitely like to see if we do have uh, anything. And also, I still can't quite figure out what this stupid switch is for. I figured it was a local distance switch, because it's tied into uh, what looks like... It's tied into the volume control. You know, um, it's entirely possible that this actually might be the tone control they were referencing. That's a distinct possibility. They may have tried to retrofit a tone control, but it still doesn't quite explain what this socket here is for. I, I don't know. I, trying to figure out what people several decades ago were thinking is kind of pointless sometimes. Let me get my Variac set up and we'll uh, see what we get on the meter. Alright, so our meter's hooked up, and I've got the uh, Variac prepped and ready to go. i set this in the lap here. And let's uh, turn that on, hit this, and the Variac is fused, so if anything goes bad, I have a good amount of control over it. Oh, what am I doing? There we go. So we have a little bit of a reading there, let's start cranking this up, we should hopefully see for the 80, I want to say about 5 volts on the filament. It'll probably go a little over that without load. Alright, 5.7.
So after uh, checking out all the voltages on here, I, I, would, I later tested out the high voltage section on the unit, found that I had pl good plate voltage and all that. Um, I did determine that the switch assembly that was installed is actually a, uh, a fairly common modification on some sets. It's a, it's a bypass for headphones. Uh, early AA5 I had had used a tip jack plugs and a small toggle switch to interrupt the, uh, the, the circuit for the preamplifier. And what they had effectively done on this Philco was take the tap off of the, the volume control potentiometer that goes to the pre-driver tube and just uh, install a bypass switch so that, that audio signal would then go to a connector and then to a pair of headphones. Um, only place that I've actually seen the little bayonet style plugs that was used on this is on uh, Siegberg jukeboxes from the 1950s, oddly enough. Uh, but I've never seen headphones with them, so that must have been some sort of a uh, interesting setup. I would imagine, though, that you would probably need some kind of a, uh, a preamplifier or something. Perhaps not for headphones. Uh, next step in this process was to go through and uh, re replace okay. all of the capacitors in the set, restuff everything, and more importantly, to uh, get all the out-of-tolerance resistors. Uh, replaced. I also wound up removing the mute control and simply running a new wire from that potentiometer into the uh, connection where it's supposed to go. Uh, only trouble with this was that this is a code 125 chassis rather than the standard code 121 and there is no Philco factory service information available for the 125 chassis. So you sort of have to look at the original and then compare it to what you've got, and I used some Philco factory uh, parts manuals to figure out what values of components were what in what blocks that weren't uh, the same. Fun process. But uh, in the next video, I will have all of that done up.